morning. Welcome to Venata Calvary Baptist Church. This is our Sunday morning message. Uh, I started a series a few weeks ago on doctrine. This is the last uh, sermon on it. Uh, let's pray before we get started into it today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. We ask now that the Holy Spirit will speak through it. Speak through me to give us what you want us to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Believe it or not, doctrine is important in today's churches. It's important to know what you believe as a believer and also to know what the church believes that you attend it. A church, our, our church here is what you would call an independent Baptist church. Independent means we are on our own. We make our decisions within this church. We don't have a board of directors. But we don't have a bunch of other churches telling us what we can or can't do. We set up our own guidelines, our own laws, to how to run our own church. And they are taken from the Word of God. We don't, they're not our opinions, not my opinions. It's out of the Word of God. That's what's wrong with a lot of churches today. They uh, got away from the Bible and what the Bible says or what the Bible believes. They're not following the Word of God, and some, as it's sad to say, are not even using the Word of God. The name Baptist is on the door. That's not necessary. We believe all Bap believe in what all Baptists believe. Some are not following the Word of God. Some have got away from the Bible and its beliefs. They have taken on the worldly ways, maybe to draw a crowd, fill a pew, whatever. The funds from this church don't come from any other organization. They come from the tithes and offerings of faithful people who attend this church. A church is run different than a business. Trouble with a lot of churches today, they're running them like a business. A church is run on faith. Faith and faith alone. We may not have a big church because we stick to the rules and the guidelines of the Bible. And that, that's why, may, may be why. But we uh, will be rewarded for this, for our faith, someday at the judgment seat of Christ. We only asked a few requirements to join the church. Salvation and baptism are the two main. Being the most important, salvation. Baptism is done after salvation doesn't add to your salvation. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. But it is a command from God. The Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to be baptized. And it does show the public what you have done inside. That you are saved. It's a command from God. It's important that we know what we believe and know what this church believes. To know what is required of you to be a member and what the bylaws of this church are, I do have a small constitution wrote up. If you'd like to have one, I can get one to you. As many follow as Baptists, we need to follow the Word of God. I am an ordained preacher. I am ordained non-denominational preacher. I done it for a reason, because I don't believe the first church was any denomination. Uh, we follow the Baptist beliefs. The first church, the disciples, they just followed Jesus Christ. They were called the way back then. A name was stuck on them. But there was no Pacific denomination. There was not a Baptist. They were not Catholic. They were not Pentecost. They were followers of Jesus Christ. We invented denominations afterwards. Denomination separates people because different belief, beliefs. When Christ started the church, the apostles, the first church, they were not Baptist. They were not Catholic. They were not Pentecost. 
they were followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come and follow me. He didn't say, come and be a Baptist. He didn't say, come and be a Pentecostal or a Catholic, whatever. He said, come and follow me. Still on the theme of doctrine, we will first look at assurance. Many today believe that you can lose your salvation, which we don't believe the Bible teaches that. We believe once you're saved, always saved. Now I'll try to clear, clear that out or show that through the Word of God. We'll be turning to a few passages. Let's first turn to 1 John chapter 5, 10 through 13. 1 John chapter 5, 10 through 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not the God hath not have made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son, son hath life, and he hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things I have written unto you, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God, and that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. John tells us that we can know we have eternal life. That's if we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have eternal life. You don't earn it, you don't get it, you have it right then. As soon as you receive Jesus Christ, you have eternal life right then. If you have the Son, you have life. Once a person is assured, assurance of salvation, it will do something to your life. It will change your life. John, the Gospel of John, 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You have eternal life right now. John 5.24, Gospel of John, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, he shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. These are very important words. But who said them? Well, let's go back and see who said them. Verses 19. And then Jesus, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. And what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father, loyal the Son, loved, loved the Son, and showed him all things that himself doeth. And he showed him great works, and then these, and that, that they, ye may marvel. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickened them, even so the Son quickened whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. In these verses, Jesus gives us three statements we we'll look at concerning himself. The first one is Jesus is God. Verse 19. Second, he raised the dead. Verse 21. Three, he gives, he is going to judge. Verse 22. Jesus is God. Is one of the doctrines that separates Christianity from cults. Cults don't believe Jesus was God. The great verse of insurance is Romans 8.16, the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When you have the Spirit of God living inside you, you will know it. Because when you sin and mess up, your conscience will start to bother, bother you and let you know. He is, that's His Spirit speaking in your spirit. And you will also see a change in your life. You will do things different. You will act different. Your life will change. If you don't have a change in the life, you better check your salvation. That's how we know we're saved, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now let's go to Hebrews, chapter 7, 
Verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost and come to my God, seeing he liveth to make intercession for you. <clears throat> he is able to save us to the uttermost. Uttermost means he saves us completely and perfectly. Eternal security goes along with assurance. We looked uh, two sermons ago, which we looked at two sermons ago. You cannot lose your salvation. If you want to go back and read, the good one to read is Romans 8, 34 through 39. We won't go into it today. Stuart tells us in these verses, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is centered in Jesus Christ. Now the doctrine of angels. We teach and believe that angels are created beings and they are not to be worshipped. Uh, angels serve God and they worship him just as we serve God and worship him. Let's go read in Hebrews, go back. Verse 1, 6 and 7. And again, when he bringeth in this first begotten of the world, he saith, let all angels of God worship him. And, and of the angels saith, who maketh his angel spirit and minister the flame to him. Let's go down to 14. Are there not all ministers and spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now let's go to chapter 2, 6 and 7. But in one certain place testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that visited him? He, thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand. We must remember, Christ is the head of angels. Angels were created by God. He created so many. They don't reproduce or they don't die. Angels are of the male agenda. If you notice, the only angels mentioned in the Bible are males, and they are Michael and Gabriel, and also Lucifer. He's an angel. He's a bad angel, but he's an angel. There are two types of angels, there's good and bad angels. Good angels have a home in heaven, but God uses them to help us and protect us down here on earth. They are called ministering angels. Again, verse 14 in Hebrews 1. They are not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Heirs of salvation, we are heirs of salvation. They are not all in earth. They are God's men, but they're also God's messengers. They are spiritual angels of spiritual beings. They are not, not what the world thinks they are today, or what the world tries to tell you they are. Cute little baby with wings and red and pitchfork, no. With wings, no. That's not what angels are like. They are a spiritual being. They don't. And to clear it up, you don't get your angels, you get wings when you go to heaven. We are not made into angels. As believers, we have at least one guardian angel. We may have many more. Of course, there are bad angels. They were used by Satan. They went and separated and followed Satan. That's why a, there is a spiritual warfare going on today between angels and spiritual warfare. And that tells us in Ephesians 6 about this. Spiritual warfare, if you want to turn to that sometime. There is a spiritual warfare going on. That's not why we need the full power of the Lord. We believe angels are good and bad, and more and more can be said about angels. I have a whole sermon on angels, which I may give you sometime. The next doctrine, which is a very important doctrine, not all churches teach this doctrine, it is separation. We teach separation from sin is clearly taught in the Bible. Turn to 2 Corinthians for a minute. Just one verse. 6.14 Be not be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion doth light have with that? Be ye separated. 
That basically tells us not to have fellowship with unbelievers. Don't do the things unbelievers do. Don't go the places some unbelievers go. It doesn't mean we will not have contact with them. We live in this world, so it's impossible to live in this world will not have in contact with unbelievers. Many churches preach hard on separation. Some even separates them so far from the world's ways and like our friends the Amish. How do you fulfill the Great Commission when you don't have any contact at all? You don't. You got to give them the gospel. Jesus sat and ate with sinners to give them the gospel. He went to people's homes to save their families. Amos 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Bible also says, Be not equally, unequally yoked with non-believers. This verse can be talking about marriage. It's not good for an unbeliever and a believer to be married. And it's not, it would even be talking about business partners. Uh, a believer and an unbeliever shouldn't go into business together because they have a different standards and different standards of living. So they will not agree. The Bible also tells us there are some times when you have to separate from believers. You even have to separate from believers. Let's turn to Matthew. Matthew 18. Uh, Matthew 18. 15 to 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his faults between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gainest a brother. But if he will not hear thee, take two with thee one or two more, even in a month, mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, to tell it to the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man in a public. This is a prescription for church discipline. It must be read in the light of the lost sheep, which is 12 through 14. How you think if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doeth he leave that ninety-nine and go, goeth in the mountains to seek that which is gone astray? If so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiced more over that sheep than the ninety-nine which went not astray. Even so, if it is not willing of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. When a brother backslides or goes into sin and lives into sin, we privately must go to him with a matter and try to resolve it. Try to bring him back, in other words. They don't refuse, bring a couple more people with you. Talk to him again. If they out and out still refuse to repent, bring it up in the assembly of the group the church, that all may lovingly pursue that lost sheep to return and to repent. The last step in most extreme cases, if it's impossible that they're going to return or repent, you must, they must be excommunicated. You no longer have fellowship. That's biblical. It's not my opinion. That's biblical. Now your personal separation as a believer. A believer must separate from the works of the flesh. Our old sinful nature. It's the most impossible, almost impossible, as I said before, to separate completely from the world. We live in this world. We got to live in this world. Jesus tells us we are the salt and light to the world. So to do this, we must have contact with the unsaved world. The key is not to let 
the world affects you, affects you. How do you do that? The key is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So the, the world's ways will not affect you. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's turn to John, 1 John, again, to uh, 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the eyes, the pride of life, are not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This whole world is going to pass away. It's going to pass away. But we are going to be with God forever. We are going to, sh we are to show God's love in our life today. Toward others. God's love is agape love, which is an unconditional love. It's a forgiving love. We are to have brotherly love to one another. That's the kind of love Christians are to have for one another. That's the kind of love the Bible teaches. It teaches agape love, unconditional love, and it teaches brotherly love. The world's love is a different kind of love. We as Christians... To live in this world, we must be separate ourselves from this world. And in its ways, as much as possible. As we witness to the world, we're going to come in contact with them. There's a fine line here. In other words, stay on the right side of the fence. Too many people are straddling the fence. Once you straddle the fence, most generally you fall off on the wrong side. Stay in prayer. Stay in God's word. Get into a good Bible-believing church where the Word is taught and preached and support that church. God works through our local churches today. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exalting one another much more as you see the day approaching. The day is the day of the Lord. The Lord's return is not far off today. We are drawing close to that day. The church age will close. We are still living in the church age today. When it comes to what, when he comes, the Lord Jesus Christ comes, what is he going to find us doing? I hope this doctrine series has helped you out, help you understand the truths of God's word. Uh, it's good for us to know what we believe and know what the church believes that we are, we are attending. Christian faith is being attacked so in many ways today. Some of our people, church, churches and Christians, are compromising and bending to the worldly ways. The church is becoming more worldly than it used to be. We need to stand firm on what the Bible says, what God says. We need to be in a church that preaches and teaches the word of God. We need fellowship also in the local church. We need to be in a place with people that believe the same as we do. Hebrews 9.25 says exalt one another. Best fellowship is found in a church if you're a believer. You're not going to find that fellowship in your local clubs or your local bars. You're going to find it in church with other Christians but also with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need him today. You need him today. If you're out there today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never repented of your sins and asked him to come into your life. For all sinners, the Bible tells us, all have sinned and can show the glory. For there are none righteous, no, not one. No one of us are, are perfect. We're all gonna fail. We're all going to make mistakes. We will make mistakes after we're saved. But they will be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood on that cross and died on that cross for you and me. 
to pay that debt of sin, which is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're not going to get there on your own. You're not going to have eternal life, or you're not going to go to heaven on your own. Ephesians 8, 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't earn our way there. It's by trusting in Jesus Christ and receiving it in your heart as Lord and Savior. And I'm going to give you that chance right now. A chance to receive Christ into your life and into your heart. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus died on that cross for my sins. I want to follow him. I want to be saved. I accept him into my life. I repent of my sins and ask for his forgiveness and receive him into my heart as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. You said that prayer, you're a Christian. Now it's important to learn how to grow. Now it's important to learn what God wants, us, wants you to do. God wants you to live. And he gives you the guidelines. He gives you an instruction book. It's called the Bible. And we teach that Bible down here on the ridge. You're welcome to come down and see us. You're welcome to come down and join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thank you.